So hello, my name is Jeremy Miller. I am the CEO of Lionfish Cybersecurity, and I'm going to be your host through tonight's events. Thank you for coming. I know we sent the invitations rather late, but we felt today was probably more appropriate to, to have this. You all should have an agenda, so I'm not going to read it, but I'll point out that we are all here for a special love of our country. It's up to us to continue to keep it, preserve it, and leave something special for our children, their children's children, just as the men and women did before us. Today is special for multiple reasons. And um, first, today is Flag Day, which everybody in this room has pledged an allegiance to fight and defend that flag. The second, it's the Army's birthday. The oldest and arguably wisest branch. <laughs> The other is uh, one of our main speakers, he's walking in now, uh, John Spinogle. Today is his birthday. And so, John, I appreciate you spending that with us today. Absolutely. And more importantly, today, we want to take the time to honor many of you in this room. The dedicated businessmen and women that chose to be DO contract, DOD contractors. It's not always an easy thing to do. As a matter of fact, it could probably be sometimes outright hard. The lack of connections, finding the right RFPs, bidding, regulations, waiting, and the whole time you gotta take care of payroll. Because of this and many other reasons, many choose not to go this route. The Department of Defense would not move without you, and by extension, therefore, our country would not be defending itself without you. As a matter of fact, there are roughly 25 million small to mid-sized businesses in the United States. Only 300,000 choose to go down that route. That puts the businesses of the DOD supply chain at 1% of the business population that actually put their money, time, and effort to support the country and the warfighters. And to me, that's pretty special. <laughs> Our team at Lionfish, along with IEDC, the state of Indiana, the PTACs, NDIA, Northeast Indiana, AFSIA, are all here to support you as you continue to support our country. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please rise as the Carmel BFW Post presents colors, continue standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Tim Pitchford, followed by the Star Spangled Banner, sung by Sammy Lorena.
Please be seated. During this next session, the staff will come by and hand out toast glasses. They are not shot glasses. So don't drink them all at once. And don't drink them yet at all. Wait until the time of the toast. So stand by. Take your uh, attention to the screen, please. I would like for you to know that I believe that if our flag could speak, these are the words that it would say. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present Old Glory. I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is Old Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings and I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically across the great institutions of learning and I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, truth, honor, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident, I am brave, I am proud, and I am ready. When I am flown with my fellow banners, my head is held a little higher, my arms a little truer, Except for my God, I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am sovereign. I am saluted. I am respected. I am honored. I am loved. And yet I am feared. I have fought in every battle of every war for more than 200 years. Some of these battles include Gettysburg, Shiloh, Appomattox, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Aragon Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, Guam, Okinawa, Korea, Kisan, Saigon, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, and scores of other places long forgotten by all. Except those that were there with me, I know because I was there. I led my special operations forces in the quiet of the night and at the tip of the spear. I saw them fight fearlessly throughout the globe every day of the year. I watched over them even during the casualties of Desert One, and they still loved me. I was on a small hill, Iwo Jima. I was dirty, battle-worn, tired. But my soldiers and my sailors, my airmen, my coast guardsmen, and my marines, they all cheered me, and I was so very proud. I was at Ground Zero in New York City on September the 11th as cowardly fanatics attacked America. I was raised from the ashes of once proud buildings by brave firefighters. These were heroes who risked their lives to save others, showing all that America, although bloodied, will never be beaten because those who would destroy me cannot win. For I am the symbol of freedom of one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have been soiled, I've been burned, I've been torn, and I have been trampled on in the streets of my own country. And when it is done by those whom I have served with in battle, it hurts. But hear me today when I say, I will overcome because I am strong. I have slipped the surely bounds of earth, and from my vantage point on the moon, I stand watch over the uncharted new frontiers of space and I have been that silent witness to all of America's finest hours. But my finest hour comes when my stripes are torn into strips to be used as bandages to cover the wounds of my fellow comrades on the field of battle. And also when I fly at half mass to honor my soldiers and my sailors, my airmen, my coast guardsmen, and my marines. But most importantly, when I'm placed into the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the gravesite of her fallen son or her fallen daughter, I am so very proud. My name is Old Glory. Long may I wave, dear God. Long may I wave.
toast here. Here's to the red and the precious bloodshed. Here's to the white and freedom's bright light. Here's to the blue and liberty's hue. Toast to the stars and stripes. I really like the way you're running your events here. <laughs> We look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth. It was because here in this land, we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bellow Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Porkchop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. 
Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. We are Americans. You know, heroes come in all shapes and sizes, including the ones of us that go to war and those that sacrifice for those that go to war. Those that say, as Reagan said, that there are no heroes and they don't know where to look. Well, I do, and I'm looking at you now. Please raise your glass to you, our friends that have supported us, the war fighter, for so many years. You have been the unsung heroes of our country. You are now the front lines of a new war, and you may not just know it yet. You are the ones that set the pace, the example, the way forward for our country. May God grant you the strength and courage to do what is necessary to move forward. The oppressor of the bear, strength and honor. So now we're going to hear from four guests to share how they can help you continue to do business with the DOD network and, um, and just do better for the country. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage Brian Langley, the senior, the senior VP of Defense Development at IEDC, to speak about IEDC and what the state can do to help you. You can see Brian's uh, bio in the agenda. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks for Lionfish. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, God bless all of you who serve and continue to serve our great country. Uh, there's a couple of things I'll make very clear to you. Indiana is in business. There's three things that I hold true in life. There's perception, there's resources, and supporting the warfighter. The perception of Indiana, for many people, unfortunately, who fly over this great state, they not, not recognize the great resources, the men and women we have here, the businesses, the companies, and the universities. That changes. Governor Holcomb said several years ago to triple defense investments, and he is doing that. We're on this path. But it's a team of teams approach. And I want to make sure that the perception of Indiana is going to change and how we effectively engage our state legislature, our regions, our congressional delegation, and the businesses who need to understand what is going on in this great state, period. The resources we have from Lionfish to all the great companies that are here today, it is a whole new ball game. Look at the near and pure competition, the threat level that we're dealing against. Look at the resources this state has here. If we just let people know what we have to sell and where we're selling it and how we're doing it. The technology, the advances that I've seen of these many great companies and businesses in Indiana is unlike anything I've seen before. We just have to raise the perception. The resources is number two. The state of Indiana has incredible resources that most people just don't know about. And here, as a takeaway for each and every one of you, we want to change your perception. The resources we have at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation are bound to support small businesses, medium and large. Please take advantage of the resources both the federal and the state has to offer. There's no greater shame in my life having worked both on the federal, state, and local side when the person asked, I didn't know that existed. Let us help you today. Of one takeaway that I ask of each and every one of you, please know that the resources are there from PTAC, from the Indiana Small Business Development Center, which provides free marketing opportunities for small businesses. Then we have our business development teams that provide tax incentives to help you grow your business, to give you more employees. Look what COVID has done to this nation. It had some vulnerabilities in our supply chain. Look no further than PPDs, the protective equipment that our first responders, for Pete's sake, were having a hard time securing. That should not happen. But this great state, these great businesses, these great resources that we have here help fill those niches. Oh, and by the way, those great companies here in Indiana are supporting the global supply chain. Look no further than cybersecurity. 
the threat that's so pervasive that it's unlike anything that we have seen truly that is set aside by man and ill intent. But we have great companies here who are combating that every day. Let's raise a uh, profile. <clears throat> Lastly, the warfighter. We must do everything we possibly can in our power to support the warfighter on the front lines. There are some incredible things the state has to offer. Let's raise the attention of the Department of Defense to diversify their supply chain by looking at Indiana because we're in the center of the state that does a lot of great things. So if you can work with us, leverage us, talk to us, I will give you my contact information, I'll work with Jeremy to push out the resources that we can help you. And as a DOD contractor, you've got to take a look at us because there's a great level of things happening in the state. And you're going to hear more further, of course, with you know, Chris and, of course, with Andy and PTAC. But if, if there's one takeaway, please leverage this great state and resources to particularly help you and grow your business. After COVID, what we recognize and what we identified that you know, government business is good business. And if you look at those small businesses who suffered mightily, what could we have done maybe further to help them to diversify the supply chain, get them government contracts? And so the more that we can support you, please leverage us. And again, we cannot thank you for all that you do and for all that you continue to do. There's great things we can do in this country. We gotta work together as a team of teams. And that's what you're finding here today. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome to the stage, uh, Andy Alexander from the PTAC. Well, first of all, Lancus, thank you very much. As a veteran, I appreciate any event to honor veterans. I'm a Vietnam veteran, 1972, door gunner, first cab. Oh, so 25 years, nine combat tours, U.S. Army Ranger. And I tell you, when I come home back then, it wasn't pretty. Today, it's just beautiful to see how we all react to each other in that. I work for an organization that's going to triple DOD contracting for this state over the next three years with the leadership we have in IADC with Cliff Tooley and Brian Langley and our state director, Chris Jeffries. I strongly believe in it, and the same conviction I had serving in the U.S. Army over 25 years. You're still serving whatever role you're in as you, you get into the OD contract tonight. The next slide, please. All right. This organization I've been with, ETAG, I've been with it for about 16 years. And uh, it was started in 1985. The program is 36 years old. This is free to the public. You've paid for it up front. So before you go out and pay consultants for add-on services and save that money, throw a Christmas party for your employees or something this summer and invite me of course. The US, is a big, US government is a big spender. They uh, spent over 6.5 trillion in 2020. They're innovative, they're competitive, and they're reliable. You can see it up on the slide. They have different types of sales and contracts uh, from micro purchases of credit cards up to blanket purchase agreements and then above 100,000 are actual contracts or bids. And these are things that we work with you on. They buy everything. When you're driving home tonight, that road, those lights, those fence posts, the, the, the things that you take for granted sometimes are not really look at. It's government provided through vendors. Every state park, every road you go down, it's something that a vendor stepped up to the plate and provided the quality services. I made a comment down at Northville. Decatur that we're not on the coast, the east or west, we're in the heartland, so we don't coast. We provide great quality service for our nation and those veterans over there. I know I survived nine tours because somebody did their job. Somebody did good quality control. And I knew it was those veterans from World War II and on that made sure that I'm up here today in 2021. Next slide. These are the uh, breakouts by the Small Business Administration for the goals that they place on the 1,200 federal agencies under the 49 federal departments. And you can see the goals there breaking from 23% down to three. And they overall achieved every goal except for the hub zone. And they were pretty close to that. They still spent $11 billion for businesses that were located in historically unutilized business zones. These types of set-asides, these types of goals and that are things that 
we can assist you with and helping the U.S. government who develops a budget to go broke meet their obligations so they don't deobligate back to the treasurer. We have four months left in this country to spend a year's budget. It's a fire sale going on. You should come and use us for what's about to occur here. The tsunami is a perfect storm that's going to hit. And right now in our state, we can make this happen now. Next slide. So one of the things we'll look at, uh, Nate and I, my counterpart from central Indiana, I'm south central, I'm down in Brown County. Uh, these are the kind of things we take a look at with your business. And in the room here right now, I've probably got about eight businesses that I've put to this gauntlet. And uh, they are better off for it in the DOD contracts that they have won and prepared to do others in the future. Next slide. These are our eight services that we provide at no cost through the Procurement Technical Assistance Center uh, under the IADC. And uh, I'll close later on with the, the team that I'm on that provides these services to businesses. You want to take advantage of our businesses. I tell a lot of businesses, if you don't use me, your competition will. And I'd rather start and work with you first and help you out and make Hoosier businesses successful at this. Next slide. So on organizing, uh, we give out a government action plan to start out each business. On the left side are a lot of the federal registrations and that for credentials, accreditations, and registrations. And on the right side is the state, but all the way down to a town, cities, and counties plus the other 49 states, you have something to sell to an embassy in Bara right now, or, or in uh, Ethiopia, uh, there's a way to find it through these systems, but you gotta do this stuff on the left first, and we can assist you with doing that. Next slide. So these are the metrics that we, we track on the success of our program, and you can see in almost every case, it's been an increase over last year. And look what we just went through as Americans. Other people in other countries admire Americans, because it's not how we fall down, it's about how we keep getting up. A lot of people are still down. We can't keep getting up economically and developing ourselves. And last year, we had a very successful year, you can see it through there, with the presidential election, the COVID disease, and, and worldwide economic issues that occurred, but Americans made a big difference. And in Indiana, we were able to work with each other to be successful in DOD contracting. Next slide. And I'd be remiss, I missed one thing there. If you can go back one slide. The return for investment, every business person that develops a budget to turn a profit, is look at the 468, their return for investment for the PTAC network. You want to be involved in that. And then it, versus in 2019, the return for investment was 185. We've about doubled it in the money that we're bringing in through the vendors here in Indiana. It's a great success story. Next slide. So our demographics, demographics with the business that we work with are shown on the left. And on the right, out of the 49 departments, 1,200 agencies, these are the top five that if you've got a match with on your goods and services, you probably want to target. If not, we'll work with you on showing you who they are out there, who you should be working with. Next slide. This is the team I work with. I'm the baby counselor. I've been with them about a year now. I've learned so much from them. Uh, we talk every Monday through Chris's leadership. We're real proud about what we're doing. And uh, my name is Andy. It's a government acronym. It stands for Actively Networking Directly for You, and that's my job. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Nick Dahl. And uh, he's the Director of Stakeholder Development at Northeast Indiana Partnership. Uh, he'll discuss NDIA and Northeast Indiana. Uh, his bio is in the program. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Dara. I work with uh, the Northeast Indiana Regional Partnerships, so we're an economic development organization focused on the 11 counties of, of Northeast Indiana. But Today I'm here representing uh, the National Defense Industry Association, NDIA. Um, so we are a statewide chapter of a national group that has over 85,000 members in it, um, really about connecting academia, private sector business, government, and leveraging all of those uh, different assets. So um, before I get too deep into it, uh, a friend and mentor of mine, a guy named John Sampson, always used to say, uh, be brilliant or be brief. 
Um, brevity's not my strong suit, so buckle in, because I'm, I'm about to play mine. Uh, just joking. Uh, so a lot of this stuff was already touched on, which is, is great, and I'm going to reiterate some of it. But um, this work is personal for me. I'm a combat vet, uh, Marine Corps, Rob, oh, I'm Rob, right. Rob, there we go. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the Army's the one, all, you know, if you want to have a good birthday party, go to Marine Corps Walk, because this, uh, this, this is pretty tame. Um, but anyways, uh, as a combat vet, I understand the need um, for, the, the, for the best equipment and services that we can have. Um, make no mistake, there's no such thing as a fair fight in war. You either have an advantage or you're likely to get killed. Um, so it is the people in this room, it is this industry of defense contractors, of people who supply the DOD with the government services and equipment um, that provide us the warfighter, the veteran, with the advantage in a fight that allows us to come home and to uh, and to serve our communities in other ways and to live our lives. Um, so the people who are making the things that you guys are making and doing the things that you guys are doing, providing the services that you're providing, um, we need to keep that on that advantage on the side of freedom and democracy. So that's why it's really important that we connect like this, that we work with the people who have these tables over here so that we can connect those dots and build those relationships because um, that's the thing that really makes Indiana different. So, you know, why is Northeast Indiana, why are we focused on these statewide initiatives? Why are we not insular and just saying we want to focus on our group? Um, because we want to connect these dots. You know, we, we, make, we make things in Indiana, right? So we, we have engineering talent and manufacturing capabilities, especially up in my corner of the state, up in Northeast Indiana, around Fort Wayne. But we have excellent IT services and R&D and our um, research universities, and especially in Central and Southern Indiana where we have the, the IT capabilities. So how do we connect those dots? How do we leverage those strengths? How do we say, if you're a small tool and die shop, and you make, you know, you drill a hole in a thing that goes in another thing that makes a widget, but that thing goes in a helicopter to make sure it doesn't fall down on top of me when I'm calling an air support. Um, that's all very important. Um, we have BF Goodrich up in Fort Wayne and Woodburn area, and they make, they're one of two factories that make tires for the Humvee. In the, in the country. And so, you know, that's something that they don't brag about that much, but that's one thing that we have to get over here in Indiana as well. We're humble losers, right? We're conservative with a small C. We, we, don't, we don't like to brag about what we do, but we need to get over that. We make things, we make them well, we can provide these sustainable resources to our defense partners. Um, and the, the folks that are up here uh, at these tables, PTAC, IEDC, um, all of these, all of these entities that we have these resources, like Brian was saying, use us. Don't just try and do it on your own. We have these assets available. Let us connect the dots. Even if you don't think you're a defense contractor, you might be able to make something that benefits the DOD and also maybe as you know, three or five or ten million dollars to your top level. How do we help you do that? We have those assets. We have those resources. Um, NDIA, the National Defense Industry Association, is, is a great way to connect those dots, to partner with these various entities and organizations. So um, I've got an iPad over here. I've got some other information. If you want to talk about Fort Wayne and Northeast Indiana, specifically what we do up there and how we can help leverage you or how we can help on a statewide thing, come see me. Um, come see Brian and Chris and, and the PTAC folks. Um, you know, if you bring us a drink, that's great too. Um, we're not, we're not, we're not, but uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, happy 246 to the to the army. Um, we're invited to my birthday party on 10 November, and uh, we'll see you guys then. <laughs>
So, uh, uh, as, as Jeremy said, I um, want to talk about AFSEA. Uh, this is another opportunity for you to connect in here with your peers in this community. I'm, I'm from, actually from Ohio, and uh, we have a chapter over there, the Dayton Ryan chapter. I've been the president of it twice, and I'm a big advocate for people coming together um, in communities and getting involved in groups like NDIA, uh, your chamber, the BFWs, and there's real strength in that. And, I, and uh, I have Miranda and Jessica putting some things out on the table. I have a gift for you, and it's kind of going to tie into why I think this is so important for Indiana and our nation to just come together and find ways to innovate. Um, we know that there's other countries out there, our adversaries, that are uh, finding ways um, to gain an advantage over the United States of America. And we need our industry base coming together with government and academia and finding ways to, to keep a competitive advantage. So two things I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you. Um, and uh, oh, I wanna mention, you may or may not know this, but as, uh, professional associations like FCF, um, <coughs> most people credit Ben Franklin as the founder of bringing people together to share best practices and collaborate and he formed the Printing Industry Association, which still exists. Ben Franklin was a printer, right? So he did a lot of cool things. Um, I have a picture here that's on the table. You can pass it around on flight day. This is actually me. Um, I was a paratrooper in the Army, uh, Army Pathfinder, Army Ranger. Been uh, jumping out of planes my whole adult life. Um, if you have any new jokes for me, I'd like to hear them. I've already heard that only two things fall from the sky, and why would you jump out of a purple good airplane? And I got answers for those, but if you got something new, I'd love to hear it. But uh, I have 6,000 jumps, and this is my most notable jump. This is me over Ground Zero in New York City on 9-11-2008. We jumped seven flags for seven years, and this is before they built Freedom Towers. I actually looked down into the empty hole in Lower Manhattan um, under canopy. And uh, I want to share this with you because it's important that we remember things like that. This is my generation's uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, my boys have no recollection of it. They're 21, 19, and 16. My 19 year old is reporting to Fort Benning here in a few weeks. So you also will find a little piece of parachute cord. I tied it into a bracelet. There's one on each one desk table here you can pass around. And I think this emphasizes the importance of in our country that we find a way to collaborate with each other and come together because there's strength in this coming together and if you look when you get the parachute cord in your hand you look at it you'll see there's a green outer sheet this is actually military grade it goes on a, a t10 parachute which i don't even know if they still jump those anymore but it's what i jumped when i was in and uh and then there's seven white strands in the middle and a lot of people would confuse that outer green sheath that's where the strength comes from and that's actually not the case um, the sheath is there to protect and bind those seven strands together. And each of us are like those white strands in the middle. And it's the combination of all those strands that makes us stronger. One individual strand isn't strong, but seven of them is powerful. And so AFSIA, NDIA, our BFWs, our faith communities, that's the green sheath that pulls us and binds us together. And that's the power of our country because we do that as a country. And uh, so I would encourage you to take your individual white string and combine it with some others and find a way to involve yourself in this community. And, and I really, I, I'm the regional vice president for AFSEA. It's a volunteer. I don't get paid for it. I get paid to create business for Segway. Um, but uh, I love to do what Jeremy's doing and the volunteers here. I like to bring people together and remind them why we're here and to support the warfighter, to support our young men and women that we're trying to give an advantage and protect our country. So uh, if, you, if you would, uh, I have some more of these, I think, if we didn't hand them all out. But uh, um, anyway, so AFSIA, we're Defense Industry Association. We bring people together. They'll have luncheons and conferences, and they'll create dialogue moments, and they'll collaborate with Northeast Indiana, I'm sure. So uh, there's ways to get involved. There's a table up here on the end. You can go down to Miranda, who's waving enthusiastically. And, uh, um, find ways to get involved. So, Jeremy, thanks for your time, sir. All right, well, thank you all for sharing on how we can help these businesses do more business and uh, help the warfighters. 
So without further ado, we'll start uh, in with our special guest speakers. And we'll start uh, first with uh, Alex Hernandez. If you don't mind coming from way down there. His hand's probably hurting right now. He's been signing all your bottles. I don't have a horse to make this fly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you, um, I'll direct your attention to Alex's bio. It's, uh, it's very impressive uh, in your agenda. Uh, if you have not had a chance to read that, I would encourage you to do so. Um, Alex has got some great words uh, to impart with us. But before I start, I'm going to go ahead and start passing this around. I didn't know it was going to be like this like a crowd, but... This is back, taken back in October, late October of 2001, uh, in northern Afghanistan. I'm I'm the second individual from the right wearing the Ray Ban sunglasses because you always gotta look cool. Where you're at, and uh, the gentleman on the lead on the white horse is the board board uh, General Gosta. Well, it is an honor to be here. I'm uh, glad uh, I was invited here to talk. Uh, I'm not sure what's in the bio, but I, I just want to talk about it briefly because it's kind of the story, my story got, got me to where uh, I was linked up with the ODA Operation of Fashion 595, the, war, the horse soldiers. Uh, born and raised in Waukegan, Illinois, north of Chicago, uh, entered the Army in 1971, went right into uh, the Green Berets, the Special Forces. Served there for uh, 26 years, retired for rank of sergeant major uh, in 1997. Uh, because uh, I had worked with CIA in previous assignments, uh, what I did was I just flipped right over from the Army and went to work for the CIA uh, when I retired in 1997. Uh, I had to become a case officer because that's what uh, the CIA does, is they recruit spies. So it's all about intelligence, so that was number one. But because of my military background, they placed me over into this, the, the section over there that's known as uh, uh, for paramilitary operations. And that's what brought me to the events that I had just returned from uh, a country in South America the day before 9-11. Uh, so when I walked in the office the morning of 9-11, there was uh, on the big screen TVs in our conference room, I, I, I stand and I watch an airplane fly into a building. And I can't believe what uh, what's happening there. I think I think it's a joke, is what I think. And uh, so I went and found some of my senior officers that were there. They came and we watched the second airplane uh, fly into the World Trade Center. Uh, my boss looked at me and he said, uh, "You can forget about uh, South America." And uh, that's what took me to the events. As our policymakers, the president, uh, and the intel community and the military uh, start with you know. Uh, putting plans into action or planning into action. Uh, we had a large laundry list of uh, select uh, Afghan key leadership that we were going to align with. And, uh, and uh, my, my leadership came to me and said, well, Alex, you and your team have been working uh, pretty hard the last couple of years, so your team is actually going to be the last one out the door, which crushed us because you always want to be the first one out the door. Uh, and uh, so with that, we just went ahead and helped our fellow teammates prepare for uh, the deployments. Uh, just to let you know, the CAA at that time did not have a robust paramilitary side of the house. We were literally a handful of officers there. And so uh, as we were preparing our buddies uh, to go out the door, uh, I had a gentleman from what I call the traditional side of the CIA, a case officer that worked the geographical area in, uh, in the world, and he had worked the fringes of Afghanistan uh, when the Russians were there. And he also spoke Dari. And he was a uh, senior to me also. So he came and he met me and he said, we're gonna be married up together when uh, our team is finally set in. And I said, that, that's great, uh, looking forward to it. He said, I have to go out to Tashkent in Uzbekistan and help the station chief out there with some, with some work. But once I get done, I'll come, we'll come back and we'll start doing our planning. So he left, I think it was on a Thursday. Sunday morning at my house, he calls me up at my home and says, how fast can you get your team out of here? I, it turns out that uh, the individual, the warlord Dostan, was not on our radar list. We didn't know he was still fighting. And he was up in North Afghanistan, and a friendly foreign intelligence service had said, hey, 
if you have war, a warlord that's still fighting right now and you're not planning to help him. And so all of a sudden, we got catapulted from last to first. Now, I say first, but there was another team that had already gone in, and it was they had gone into what is called the Benalt, the Northern uh, Liaison, Afghan Liaison Team. And if they went into an area that's up in Northeast Afghanistan, up in the Panjshir Mountains. Uh, they were a well-established tribe that had been fighting against the Taliban for years. What I didn't know at the time was that they had tanks, they had artillery, they had helicopters, they wore uniforms. They actually had an established line, so you know that the enemy was on that side and the friendlies were on this side. That I didn't know. So when we say we were the first team in, we were the first team that went into what we call a denied area that literally is controlled by the enemy except for the ground that you stand on. So that's, I took an eight-man team in, we flew out to uh, Tashkent uh, with the help of our military colleagues, the uh, Night Stalkers, Task Force 160, they, uh, they inserted us. Uh, just to give you an idea of the planning for this mission, okay, the air crews, one of my guys came to me and said, hey Alex, they want to know what our plan is once on, on infiltration. And I said, uh, well, you know, it's going to be kind of simple. Tell them when they land that we're going to get off the helicopters with our gear. And <laughs> if they're not shooting at us, we're going to stay. If they're shooting at us, we're going to get back on the helicopters. So tell them don't take off too quickly. We literally did not know uh, if, this, if we were being set up. If this was a Taliban, Al-Qaeda uh, ruse to get an American team to come into this region, either kill us or capture us. We didn't know. Uh, we had spoken with Dostam over a, with a system that's called the uh, Inmarsat, ship to shore system for the satellite. Uh, it was uh, in the clear, so our, our Russian colleagues were listening in. We were talking, and, uh, and we just wanted to get a sense of where he was at, how he was doing. And it surprised me when we asked him, what do you need? And he said, horse feed. I need horse feed. And he said, hey, can you clarify that? And he said, that was his mobility. He didn't have vehicles. Uh, uh, to move his troops around on it, so we had a rather large, I'd say about a 400 man, maybe more force than I saw that uh, rode on mounted cavalry. So, uh, uh, with that in mind, I told them, okay, we got the coordinates, we were able to set up the coordinates where we could bring the helicopter safely in. We asked them, don't, don't, no lights, don't, you don't have to do anything special. These are very special helicopters, we'll be able to land here. So now we're literally flying over. Nothing but pitch bad darkness in Afghanistan. But when I could see on the distance, as we made our approach, I thought I was looking at what I was doing, uh, the old type of uh, used car sales lot where they had a string of light bulbs uh, defining the parking lot at night. And, I, and that's what he had set up for us out in the middle of nowhere. I'm going to backtrack just a little because when I was talking to, to the interpreter to Dostam, I said, where's he at? How's he talking to us? He said, well, I'm using an Inmarsat. Yeah, but is it in your headquarters? Where are you at? He said, no, I'm close to Herat, and I'm sitting with an Iranian intelligence officer using his Inmarsat. Now, if you know our tensions with Iran, they were a little different back then than they are now, and probably even more so. So I kind of understood that this was a bad situation, that the Iranians wanted us to come in and help blow them out, that just kind of set the tone there. So anyways, we, sent, we, we landed in two helicopters. I had an eight-man team. Uh, not all of them were parallel three officers. A couple of them were, I could call the traditional case officers that sole mission in line is to go out and recruit spies. Uh, I had a, also a physician's assistant uh, that augmented us. He had military background, which was good. He knew which end of the rifle the bullet came out of, okay, so that was important for us. Uh, and when we landed, uh, as I entered the helicopter, I was like Blackhawks took us in. I looked over. And I saw what looked like a, 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 a diamond-shaped formation coming at me. But they were only this tall. And they looked like those, I don't know what they're called, but in Star Wars, they had these scavengers uh, that, that rode around a mechanical machine. I think they called them fuzzy walks or something like that. And that's just, so here are these guys coming to us, and they're only this tall. And I'm thinking, come on, that can's got to be taller than this. Well, what I didn't know is that they had approached the helicopters, and there are heights, and a couple of my guys had signal to them to crouch down because we didn't want them to get hit by the rotors from the helicopters. 
So that's, they were just basically duck walking toward us. Uh, they were so cool to see us. The first major event that happened that same night, now we're pretty tired right now because we've been going probably for good, over some 48 hours in mission planning and launching. And, uh, but Dostum was a pretty smart guy. He understood that he had to make sure that all the other tribal chiefs in the region understood that we were there for all of them, not just him. The intertribal rivalries were so intense back then that they would work to undermine each other if they thought otherwise, if one was getting the upper hand, even so far to the extent to sabotaging relationships and maybe working with or collaborating with the Taliban. So we went to a, a, a meeting, which they called the Jirgo over there. Uh, again, I, I felt I was walking into something that was back 1,500 years ago. A low, a low mud brick building, and all that was in there. This was in October, so it was pretty cold. Uh, and there was a bench, a, a, a mud bench, on the three sides of this building, with one wood stove in the middle. And it was all carpeted. When I walked in there, um, everybody looks tremendously ferocious, I guess is the best way of putting it, with the long beards, the hardened faces of living a hard life in Afghanistan. Uh, I, if you saw them on the street, you would have said any of them was a terrorist in their bias, okay? And, uh, and they were all talking and everything. So anyways, Dostan made the introductions, and that's what kind of like sealed the deal, that he got the buy-in from the local tribes up there. Uh, what was interesting was my colleague who spoke Dari, he said, they just asked me my name. And I hadn't thought about this. Normally, we work with an alias when we work with, uh, with individuals like this. And so he had told them that he was, his name was Uncle Jahan, his alias. And I said, well, he said, what do you want to be called? And I said, just give him my first name, whatever it is, and Dari. And I said, it wasn't, it wasn't important because there was so much noise in that room. And I said, they're not going to hear it anyway, so I don't think it's very important at all. Well, when he said, he held his hand over to me and he said, this is Alex in Dari. You could have heard a pin drop on the carpet all of a sudden. I said, they're listening. And then he looked at me and said, oh my God. He says, they don't have a written history. They have a oral, oral history. And the only Alexander that they know is Alexander the Great. <laughs> <laughs> so now I put myself on the spot. I knew that I was going to be watched every second. This was very much, this tribe was uh, the Uzbek tribe. And uh, they, their legacy, their heritage, they link themselves to, to the Mongol wars. They pride themselves on being excellent horsemen and they're fierce warriors. They're not laid back guys. So, uh, so I, I put myself in the spot when we did that. Uh, and so then after about four days, three or four days, we definitely had vetted Dostam. He was fighting. He was standing on his last legs. Uh, we had to get help. Uh, I just let you know, we didn't have an expo plan. So wherever Dostam was going to go, we were just going to marry up with him and you know, maybe end up in Ron. I wasn't sure. Uh, but uh, we, we uh, called back and we said, we got to get a special forces team in here uh, right now. And uh, that's when uh, ODA was inserted by helicopter uh, a day later or so. Now I'm going to go back a little bit just to before the team uh, left uh, Karshikhanabad, where they were based out of, uh, up in southern Uzbekistan, is that uh, this was our first opportunity to have a resupply. Uh, we're CIA officers. As a last resort, if the, the military was able to commit in a timely fashion, we were prepared to assist Dostam in waging the fight. Okay? But that was the job of the U.S. military, of our Special Forces brothers. Uh, but here was the first opportunity to get a resupply. And so uh, we called up the station chief on our secure communications of Tashkent, and uh, we had already discussed what we needed. So uh, uh, in our intelligence work, what we were, one thing I will divulge here is that what we were doing is we were facilitating defections, large-scale defections from the Taliban. <coughs> so what we were able to do with money uh, is buy the loyalty of the guys that were fighting across from us. And when Dostam suggested this initially, you know, I asked, I said, yeah, but you know, if we give them this money and then we go into our first attack, how do we, how do we trust them? How do we know they're not going to shoot us in the back? And he goes, well, that's easy. We put them in the front. 
They're going to lead the attack. And so that's how that he, we vetted that. Uh, so we had already used our money. So some of you may be familiar with the military. Some of you may be familiar with the green, a green style, what they call aviators kickback that Air Force guys or pilots carry around their gear in. It's about this big. Well, I know you can put $3 million in that bag, okay? So we asked the station chief, we need $3 million. That was number one. Number two, the tribe we were working with is, uh, is Uzbek, so they're not what I call 100% Muslims, practicing Muslims, so they like to drink a little bit. So the second kickback, we wanted full of small bottles of vodka. Okay, so that was the second kickback. And the third kickback, as a joke, I said, send us condoms. Okay, and I said it purely as a joke. Uh, and you know, condoms do have a use in, in the military, and they, they slip over the end of the barrel, rifle barrel to kick water from uh, coming into the barrel. Well, I didn't expect to get the condoms, but they came, okay? <laughs> so, but, uh, so Mark Mooch was a team leader of ODA 595. He didn't know me, we had never met before. Uh, so when they gave their brief back to their colonel, who uh, retired as a lieutenant general, John Mulholland, that's the briefing where the team uh, basically gains the confidence of the commander that they are capable and ready to, to do the mission. And so when he fin they finished their briefing, uh, John told them, they said, okay, listen, if you're going down there, there's a guy down there, don't mess with him. His name is Alex. He's a retired Special Forces Sergeant Major, so don't try to pull the wool over his eyes. And that's, that's the word he gave him. And then, the, the, as always in the military, the logistics guys came in, the money guys came in, and they made Mark sign for $3 million. They made Mark sign for a bag, a kickback full of vodka. And they made Mark sign for a kickback full of condoms. And they, and they said, and give this to Alex. Well, Mark never told me this, and I didn't see him for 10 years, I think it was. 10 years later, Mark has the, the the nerve, the, 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 the courage to tell him, you know Alex, I didn't know you. He said, and all of a sudden they, they came in here, they sent me to sign for $3 million, a bag full of vodka, and a bag full of condoms. And I thought, I want to work for this guy. <laughs> so, but when they got on the ground, uh, in their words, that started a relationship. Uh, one team joined at the hip, one flight. And we were together for uh, three months as we are made our way up to Mazar. Uh, again, we provided the intelligence support while uh, Mark and Bob and the rest of the team, principally through, uh, through uh, uh, amazing targets for the Air, Air Force to hit. Uh, that was the primary way that they destroyed uh, our enemy as we made our way up. Uh, that picture there that's going around, that was actually uh, my first date, that was our first daytime ride. I should tell you a little bit about the Calvary that those on the head. 99% uh, of us never had been on a horse. The only horse that we might have been on was the one uh, that's close by your home when you're growing up as a child. And uh, you go on the trail ride, and then at 4 o'clock, the horse knows it's time to turn around and go back to the stables and knows exactly where to go. Okay? Uh, these horses were stallions. Uh, so I use the term pit bulls. It was like riding pit bulls, they would, if they got anywhere close to each other, uh, they wanted to fight fight each other. Um, and the saddles, you can't, you can't see too well in that picture, but it's like a very comfortable saddle, it's wooden, but the stirrups are fixed. And they ride their horses like jockeys with their knees high, uh, really high on the horse. And I was already an old man, I'm even older now, but I was an old man 20 years ago after having had a career in Special Forces. Uh, so the, the most painful thing I had ever experienced was those horses, riding those horses in my knees. Five minutes after I mounted a horse, we could not adjust the stirrups. We couldn't fabricate anything that we could get our boots on quickly just in case we needed to. So we had to ride uh, those saddles. Uh, we did get an airdrop, I think it was on Thanksgiving Day, of um, the uh, McClellan saddles. We ordered McClellan saddles. Well, we didn't know the drop was coming in. So not only did we lose the saddles to the locals who moved the, the skirt out to the drop, but we also lost our, thank, our Thanksgiving meals that night too. So, that, but, uh, so five to 10 minutes after being on a horse, the fronts of, your, the fronts of my knees 
uh, would start uh, with a pain. And our rides were anywhere from five to 11 hours in duration. Mm -hmm. My biggest fear was getting off the horse and collapsing because I didn't want to fall down in front of Dostan's troops. Uh, I just didn't want to do that. So I was always ginger about getting off the horses. The horses were not shoes, so we were always riding on these gold trails on the sides. We weren't up in the big mountains, but we were in the valleys, and there was about a thousand foot drop from the top of the valley to the, to the, to the river down below. And the trails were not very wide at all. Wide at all. So my biggest heroin experience when I was in Afghanistan was not getting shot at, was when the horse behind me in the middle of the night, I know it's a drop off to the left, when the horse behind me bites my horse in the butt, and my horse wants to turn around and deal with the horse behind me. It took forever to keep him facing forward as he was scrambling, and I thought we were actually gonna lose it and go off over the edge. Uh, I had one guy that did come off the horse because the, uh, the girth hitch, the belly band slipped, and he was fortunate because he rolled uh, uphill. He turned into the hill, and he landed uphill. So, uh, but, uh, so riding the horses were, was, uh, we, we, we all thought if we survived the horses, we'll survive everything else in that uh, in her battle. Uh, the relationship with Mark, Bob, and, uh, the, and the entire team was solidified uh, during that experience. Uh, there, uh, I, I will tell one one story because yeah, I noticed you mentioned uh, uh, veterans uh, quite nicely today. Uh, I did lose an officer when I was over here during this operation. His name is uh, Mike Spann. Uh, he was a former Marine officer, a captain when he separated from service from the Marine Corps, and uh, and came and joined the CIA as a paramilitary officer. He's an incredible man. Had a young family, um, and. Our situation the entire time, the entire time was very, very fragile. Uh, uh, even though we had made, gained great grounds and had pushed uh, the Taliban out of, uh, of Mazari Sharif, and they had all consolidated on the, uh, the city to the east called Kondu, Kondus, uh, the, uh, the, uh, anything could have tipped the scales. We were so spread out, so thin that a well-organized force of a hundred men that were willing to die could have took the scales in seconds. If they and that was the that was their plan when three hundred of them surrendered to us. And I was not there at that event. I had already moved to the region uh, south of Columbus to establish a blocking force with another tribe because we were getting ready to to squeeze Columbus and we didn't want them to get back down to uh, Kabul. So it was there on a blocking force. Uh, when I got the word that there had been a prisoner uprising at a fortress called Kalijangi, just south of uh, Mazari Sharif, and what they did was they overpowered the, the thin number of Afghan troops that were there, segregating them, trying to search them, and where Mike and another one of my officers, Dave Tyson, were just beginning to uh, debrief these individuals. We were concerned that there might be another threat to the United States on the scale of 9-11, and that's why they were they conducting uh, the debriefings that, that early in the game. Uh, but they overpowered Mike, and he was uh, uh, shot in the head with his own pistol uh, on that event there. Uh, so I do want to pay tribute to Mike also, because he was the first American uh, to sacrifice, sacrifice his life over there. Uh, I will tell you that I, really from the heart believe that I speak for all of us when I talk about uh, these events because this was 9-11 uh, happened to all of us and affected all of us in some way or another and uh, we were just a handful of guys we weren't the only team there was at least 10 maybe 12 or more other special forces teams uh, with small CIA contingent teams co-located with them that went into various parts of Afghanistan so this was just this is just one of the stories. And uh, what, I, what I'm most honored and privileged about on this is that, is that we were able to, what I call, avenge what happened on 9-11. And that's what I think it means to all of us. And, uh, so, and anyways, I'd uh, like to end it there. Uh, said I had about 30 minutes. Uh, I, I ramble on forever, but if you have any questions about anything, I'll, I'll answer them.
I'm not glad to come up so I can hear you. I got a big voice. You still ride horses? Uh, no, I won't. Uh, I tell I tell people in my special forces career, I used I used to do different things. That I tell them if you ever you know I used to climb. So I tell them if you ever find me at the base of a cliff, of a cliff dead, suspect foul play. I used to <laughs> combat diver. If you ever find me in a cave where scuba diving equipment dead, find suspect foul play. And if you ever hear I was killed in a horse accident, riding accident, suspect foul play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Really enjoy hearing the backstory there. Uh, not many of us have heard some of that story at all. So I want to um, I want to welcome to the stage uh, retired John Spinoble, Lieutenant Colonel John Spinoble, and uh, he and I became friends. So we had lunch one day. I just tell the story, and John says, "You know, we should we should probably uh, start a special force association chapter here so we can hang out with our buddies and uh, reconnect." And uh, I don't know. A few, few months later, we're, we started the first Special Forces chapter here in Indiana, and uh, it's been a great uh, time knowing John ever since. So I'm excited to hear his story. So please welcome John Spinoza. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Uh, you know, kind of coming off the cuff here, just just to kind of give you a background on the Southside kid, went to Paramount in high school, so. Lived here in Indianapolis my whole life until I was 18, until I left home. Uh, lucky for me, I uh, had a mentor that came from the, the Delta Force and kind of told me about Special Forces and really had no clue what that was. And I'm like, wow, that sounds interesting. Went through, got, got selected, went through training, and uh, it got through it. I was lucky enough to uh, get selected to the 5th Special Forces group. My story is kind of unique because uh, my family's kind of entwined uh, when we talk about 9-11 and, and, and going into Afghanistan. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie 12 Strong? A lot of you? Alright, so part of that movie yeah, is the beginning, you know, and, the, and not knowing what, what was going on. <clears throat> that day was a very unique day. I was actually in the bottom of the swimming pool scuba diving. And uh, we were doing some dive training, some demolitions in the pool. And I get this notice up, 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 and somebody says, a Cessna just hit the Sears Tower. And we're like, so we get up and we're like, who cares? You know, what, who cares? I said, what was that idiot doing? Probably didn't move the tower. So we go back down and start scooping diving. Finally, somebody threw a weight in the bottom of the pool and told us to get up. And we were like, what's going on? We're under attack. First plane just hit the World Trade Center. We were gone. We started picking up our gear, putting the Humvees. We're heading back to the Special Forces Group headquarters. <clears throat> At that time, um, I didn't, I didn't really grasp it, but we got, we got back to, to the team room to see the second plane hit the World Tower or the World, the uh, World Trade Center. That day. Uh, unbeknownst to me, really not thinking about it, I had to get on the, the phone to my mother. My sister worked in Manhattan. She was a South Inspector Department. She saw that second plane hit personally. She's sitting right back there. And he's been over. She didn't survive. So, calling my mother, I'm worried about my family. We got other things going on. We're scrambling in the team room, trying to figure out what's what's next, what we're doing. And my mother finally calls me. Sister's running down the street. She's a little bloody, but she's crying. She's screaming. That means she's alive. I'm all good today. But my mother tells me the next thing, and I had no idea that, hey, your dad's in Washington, D.C. He's supposed to be in the Pentagon today. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He was actually supposed to be in that office that got hit that day. If you don't know whose office got hit that day, his name was Lieutenant General Timothy Maughan. He's an actual Indianapolis, Indiana bank. He had just moved in that office two weeks before, just got redone in the Pentagon. The plane hit directly in his office, killed him, his aide, and most of the staff. We couldn't find out where my dad was for about nine hours. He was actually in Congressional Hill. He was a national agent of the American Legion at the time, and he was lobbying at Congress. 
Couldn't get a hold of him. They actually pushed him into a hotel. And the greatest thing about him being the Vietnam era vet, the vets that he was with, all the kids were panicking what's going on. And he went, the way he tells the story is the vets took over, calmed everybody down, put him, put him in a, a ballroom, got water, and just calmed everybody down. We finally got word back that he was good. He actually jumped on the train, picked my sister up, threw her back in the Indianapolis. Mom's like, this is great. Everybody's safe. And my cat turned to her and goes, are you kidding me? He goes, here's the youth. My mom had no clue what unit I was in, time what I did. And she said, no, our son's going to be deployed real quick. Took about a month. Uh, I was on a plane heading to a place called Karshikata, K2 base. Um, if you're not reading about it now, the government put us on a very bad piece of land. A lot of... Uh, Chemical weapons, depleted uranium, we're all kind of getting sick of it now, so we're, we're fighting the VA on this. But that's where our base was at. Uh, I'm gonna kind of piggyback on some of Alex's uh, stories here because they're kind of intertwined here. At K2 base, this is where we isolated. We put uh, special forces teams into isolation. We couldn't talk to each other. Once you went into tents, you didn't see your buddies from the other team, you didn't see your buddies from the other companies. You didn't see them from the other time. Food was brought to you, you were in total isolation. You get your mission packet, you start planning. And tell, just like uh, uh, Alex was talking about, Colonel Mulholland at the time, who was our group commander, retired as a three-star general, uh, come in with Sergeant Major, and we, we start briefing. Our siege facility, J3 at the time, was a 10th group guy, great guy, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, named uh, Colonel Mark Rosengard, just a big old hockey player. He's the one that poked holes in everything that you said. And so, you had to get past Colonel Rosengard to get your team in Afghanistan. My team uh, kind of got in a little late. Uh, we had, you know, Mark, Mark had his team. Mark's a good friend of mine. Him and I actually served together as another team you know, in Iraq. Uh, him and I took another special forces team after that. So all the horse swords of guys, good friends of mine. Uh, they were in Mazar Sharif. They were taking uh, Bagram down. So the plan was to take the three major cities first. We take the three major cities, uh, Maja Sharif, Bagram, and uh, Kandahar, the rest of the country would fall. So just like Alex said, we had about 12 special forces teams going in. Unfortunately, on the day, December 5th, uh, some of you might remember this day, we had an errant bomb uh, land on OEA 574. And it was due to a malfunction in one of our GPSs. I don't, some people say we changed batteries at the wrong time when uh, 2,000 pound bombs were being dropped. We had B-52s flying above us 24 hours a day in eight shifts. It was a great thing at night because if I saw the contrails, it was just the you know, beauty of it. I could always drop 2,000 pound bombs anytime I needed them. What happened though, unfortunately, when they called in the airstrike, the GPS reverted back to uh, the Special Forces team's location. That J Dam took out, landed right, pretty much from what I know, from what I heard was uh, Jeff Davis. Dan uh, Penitori was killed, and Cody Prosser was wounded. We tried to get him out. He actually died on the LZ, uh, trying to get him out to a Navy ship. ODA 574 is decimated. I remember Colonel Rosenberg comes straight to me. He ran into me. He goes, "Get your team ready." He goes, you, and "I said, well." We were actually planning on going, going into Coast Guard Dennis. They were already in planning stages, uh, planning stages of Anaconda at that time. Operation Anaconda in the Coast Guard Dennis region. Uh, so we had to scramble. They had lost an ODA. All they had was a battalion headquarters element of about four people and a, and a company level headquarters element down there, but no, no true operators at the time. 524 was already prepped, ready to go. ODA 524 jumped on the birds and they were gone. So they were the first ones on the ground. I was waiting for my task force 160 helicopters to come in. Uh, we finally switched mission and that's the greatest thing about special forces teams. Man, we are flexible, we are on the move no matter what. Change of mission, boom, we can change in five seconds. We did a couple pre-planning, waited for the task force birds to come in and we flew. We flew from K2, which is just south of uh, Tashkent, Uzbekistan, all the way to a place called Terracote, Afghanistan. Four refuels, 
on these helicopters over to Hindu Kush, and most of the team went into hypoxia going over over the mountain range. We had no air, we had no oxygen on these birds. Just like in the movie, you saw guys puking. It was it was it was pretty nasty. We couldn't wait to get off the helicopter. Uh, once we got off the helicopter, uh, Colonel Dave Fox was there at the time. He was my battalion. He was actually my battalion commander. Uh, said, get your teams in and split teams. Uh, unbeknownst to me at the time, the tribe that we linked up with, like Alex was linking up with uh, General Dawson, the tribe I was linking up with was Hamid Karzai's tribe. Hamid Karzai almost got killed in that airstrike. 20 of his Afghan uh, counterparts, uh, our counterparts did die. We lost three. Uh, multiple wounded. Karzai actually got a big old scratch right across the face. Luckily, he was in a building uh, on a cell phone at the time, and he got that call that night that he had just become uh, the president of Afghanistan, free Afghanistan. So you got a pretty big deal. Uh, our agency guys scooped him up, put him in the helicopter, and they flew him off. I never saw him again after that. His second in charge was Khan Mohammed. So I was married up with uh, General Khan Mohammed at the time. Uh, we separated out and split into uh, split teams. Uh, we went into four split teams of, of three Green Berets per. And we kind of married them out in like companies, you know. So we had three advisors per a company element, uh, anywhere from uh, 40 to 60 uh, Mujahideen out there that, that were going to fight. We used to get radio calls back and going, hey, uh, I speak Arabic, most of my team spoke Arabic, none of us spoke Dari, none of us spoke Pashtun, but we had some Russian speakers and Arabic speakers. The reports I was getting back were, we got some Arab speakers within the ranks. And I'm like, okay. So I'm talking to Khan Mohammed and all them, they're like, that's Al Qaeda. You just point up, straight up, that's Al Qaeda that you're in there. And so we had to keep eyes on them, we didn't want any internal fratricide, so I mean, just very tense moments when you get there. Uh, so kind of moving forward, we linked up. We just kind of moved from Terraco. Uh, we followed the Anahabad River Valley down into Kandahar. And we were actually expecting a huge battle in the Kandahar. That was their last bastion. Uh, Mola Omar, you know, we had heard he had, he had moved south. Uh, we didn't know if he crossed the Pakistani border yet. Uh, but we were expecting a, a major firefight going house to house in, in Canada. Uh, we actually thought it was a suicide mission. But, you know, being, being who we are, as you push forward, that's your mission, and we went forward. Uh, unbeknownst to us, at the time, uh, we had another team, Texas 17, was south of us, and then we had another uh, team on, on the west side. So we kind of had, we had Canada surrounded. And Karzai actually got on the cell phone, his cell phone to the Taliban leaders in Kandahar, and he got him to surrender. He didn't fire a bullet going into Kandahar. Which thank, thank God he did, because it, it, it would have been, been pretty messy. Kandahar is a pretty big city, and going in, the airfield's about 20 miles, or about 20 kilometers south. Uh, so we started uh, establishing positions. Uh, we had a governor named Gol Olga Shirzai. Big Afghan who loved to wrestle, and he tried to wrestle every single one of us at the time. And I'm like, I'm a big guy, I'm 6'4", and I'm like, this guy is a monster to me. And I was like, I'm not wrestling. Either. And the great thing is, he had his two sons and his wife with him the whole time, so we got to meet his family. And we moved into the governor's palace with him. Uh, my AOB commander at, at the time, and you guys might find this hilarious, the last Trump Secretary of Defense was uh, Chris Nutter. Well, Major Chris Miller was actually my AOE commander in Canada. So it's pretty cool to see one of your former commanders become Secretary of Defense. Uh, so we, we kind of spread out. You know, I stayed there all the way through uh, March of that year. Kind of the march down and kind of piggybacking off of Alex. Uh, you know, we had some mountainous regions and, and stuff like that. And, and they tried to put me on one of the horses. And when Alex says them horses are, are pit bulls, my feet would have been dragging on the ground. And there ain't no way in hell I'm, I'm gonna put my butt on a wooden saddle. So I let my other teammates go do that. I said, give me a Toyota Hilux, you know, with a big machine gun in the back of it so I can ride. I'm like, there's no way I can get on that horse. I tried to get on it and my feet was 
literally this far from the ground. I was like, no, I'm not doing this. Uh, but uh, like I said, we eventually took Kandahar. Some of the great things that people don't ever hear, they don't hear the combat piece up. But seeing the markets open up in Kandahar, knowing the top line was gone, one of the greatest things we saw was kites. Children flying kites. They were not allowed to fly a kite at all. And these kite shops would pop up. And we would go down and buy massive amounts of kites and just hand them out to kids. And what we do is we get up on the roofs and we battle the kids. If we're, we were up there just kind of watching the city, we were in the high point. And they would come and they got so good, they would cut your line and they would just laugh and giggle and giggle. And we just started building a floor with the locals that way by flying kites, buying kites, and just getting them out. Uh, so we started building that rapport there, uh, but reports were that Taliban was trying to come up through Pakistan, and then Coast Guard devs started started heating up. Uh, I actually got moved to a place called Kalat, which is the road going straight into Bagram, it's the longest road going from Kandahar to Bagram, and I had to go watch the crossings of all the Taliban that were in high 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 mountains of the Hindu Kush. Crossing. I had a SEAL, uh, SEAL platoon with me. We were in high sites and we had a report on everybody who was going into the Hindu, or from the Hindu Kush over into the Coast Guard Desert. And uh, that's where Operation uh, Anaconda kicked off. I was just a security force on that uh, and, and kind of supported from, it, from the outside point of that. But uh, it, was a, it was a great, great experience. Uh, one thing we don't talk about a lot. And, you know, I spent a career in Special Forces, I spent 25 years in, 17 years as Green Beret, but my wife sitting back here, she went through all of this as well. I mean, you're talking multiple, multiple rotations, and we do not give enough credit to our wives back here. And I'd like to say, thank you for this said she went through all these deployments I, I call her on Sunday couldn't tell her where I was she understood she took care of the family she did everything so uh, I really want to stress that I mean I've heard Marine Corps vet, you know, Vietnam veterans we all know we couldn't do what we do if we didn't have that spousal support so I appreciate it but uh, that's kind of my story actually you know uh, from then on uh, Mark Nooch, he talked about Mark, uh, Link took his team up, Link with Alex. Uh, Mark and I actually got the opportunity to command another Special Forces team, which is very rare uh, in the community. Him and I were team leaders together for almost five and a half years. Uh, we went straight from a team leader to a major, and that, nobody likes doing that, but uh, we commanded uh, uh, troops in the uh, Commanders in the Extremist Force for Fifth Group, which is our direct action company. Uh, him and I, right after Afghanistan started uh, deploying in uh, Djibouti, Africa, we stood up Djibouti, Africa in 2002. We started running counterterrorism ops in Somalia and Yemen, uh, started getting the drone strikes going. I mean, a lot of people don't know that that started way back in 2002. So once we started doing that, then uh, Afghanistan or Iraq rolled around. Uh, Mark and I took all our teams again, went straight to Ali Asalim, and we're raped across the board. So two days before the uh, attack on Iraq, uh, we took our special forces teams across uh, into strategic areas uh, in what we call call the ball for uh, big army, big marine. Uh, Mark had the, uh, I think the tar on the side. I had the third ID side. And we started uh, calling in uh, strategic air drops for, for uh, those forces coming across their lines. And then thank God, once they got in there with their big tanks and our little trucks, we hit right in between them. So uh, uh, it got a little scary at times because our, our trucks actually looked like uh, they were kind of closely resembled the Fedayeen at the time. And so a lot of people were like, look at the Fedayeen, they did sh shots at our trucks. So we had to figure out VS 17 panels anywhere marking the, so we didn't get friendly, uh, friendly fired on us. But uh, we just kept deploying, deploying, deploying. And, Thank God, uh, I, I pray I do this all again. I, I absolutely love Fifth Special Forces Group. It was it was truly, you know, it, 
Jeremy put in there, you know, the hero. I served in amongst the heroes. I mean, it was just an amazing career. Unfortunately, my body couldn't keep up with the Rakers. Uh, and luckily, uh, uh, when I was at the Pentagon working uh, in the in the counterterrorism uh, cell in the Pentagon, uh, I had a son Jackson, and my wife and I decided, I think we're done. So. It's, Great, I got an eight-year-old son, and I got a two-year-old granddaughter now, so it's great. Turned 50 today, so thank you for the birthday wishes. Uh, but, uh, so, I appreciate the fact that. Any, any questions for me? I mean, you know, like Alex said, you know, uh, we, all, we all linked up, he linked up with Mark. I had my set of case officers as well. They worked everything. Oh, I'll tell you another story. So, Alex was talking about the money bags. He is not lying. So his case officers came up to me, and I don't know if you remember back in back in the eighties what we gave uh, what we gave the uh, Mojave back in. We gave him the Stinger missile system, right? Well, guess what? The agency had a list of all the serial numbers that they had not recovered, and they were like, "Fine, if you can find these, if they're out there, we will buy them back at two hundred fifty thousand dollars apiece." All right, got it. We put the intelligence out. I got a call one day. I've got two. And I'm like, and they were like, are they, they can't be active. I mean, these, these things were early 80s, you know, batteries got to be dead. And I'm like, I'm going to go find out. So we had a, a spot out in the desert because they didn't want to be known. And we're, we're going to go purchase these. So I had two of those kit bags. I had half a million dollars in the kit bag. And if those serial numbers matched up, I'm giving that dirt farmer half a million dollars in American cash. Good for us, both of those had the right serial numbers. The thing that scared everybody to death, there were seven good batteries. And we charged them up and made sure they worked, and they worked. So to get those off the street to the case agent, you know, the case agents that were out there uh, finding these, us, us doing the due diligence, I can't imagine a stinger out in the world that actually still worked for the 80s. We had nine batteries, seven of them worked, and we charged every one of them, brought them back to our case officers, turned them over, and they were, they were even like, whoa, you know, where, how did they keep these batteries charged? But it was just amazing. They kept them. We never had an incident. Air Force, once they found that out, I don't think they wanted to fly too much <laughs> anymore. I said, but we got you, we got you. Uh, but yeah, I got to purchase two of those and a couple Chinese HN5s that were kind of kind of right off of the stinger. But so just kind of what Alex is saying, I'll take you back off it. Those those are the the untold stories that nobody really knows about. And, and when the agency comes off with a black bag full of money, they actually come off that bird from a lot of money. They, they had it in those kit bags. So, uh, but uh, if anybody's got a question, I'll answer any questions. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, John and Alex. You know, the historic missions of these men and the men of the Special Forces units give us hope and a way forward how to successfully fight an unconventional warfare. These men went into harm's way across the world to fight our enemy, and they worked with the methodology of the Special Forces working alongside local people to defeat a common enemy together. By, with, and through the local population, and they were able to turn the tide. During this time, you, the men and women of the DOD supply chain, supported them mainly from home, but several of you came overseas as well. You have always been there for the country in the time of need, and we thank you. It seems that your service to our great country is not over. The war is waging today. It's different, it's silent, it's invisible. The war I'm speaking of, and I regret, regret to say that we are losing. The threats have changed, tactics have changed, the approach vectors, the overall battlefield has changed. Cyber warfare has been emerging a while while we're distracted. A small handful of people watching and sounding the alarms, many have not listened 
And that enemy of America has become stronger, bolder, better, and bigger. Foreign Policy Magazine estimates China's PLA to have her army is almost 100,000 men and women. Put that in perspective, the Indiana Guard is only 14,000. I don't know if she's here or not. We have the 127th Cyber Battalion just stood up for Indiana. Are you here, ma'am? Please stand up. This is Lieutenant Colonel Rosefield Dolor. I have to say that they have the hardest job in the military today. They are the next evolution of special warfare, and they're doing it with not very much resources. You have less than 100 people in your unit. We got 100,000 in the Chinese PLA. The Army itself has 480,000. Chinese hackers alone are 20% of our total Army. This doesn't count Russia, North Korea, Iran, etc. All focused on destroying us. Army Cyber has 16,000. That's only 16% of the Chinese Army Cyber Force. If you think for one minute that someone's going to come and save you and your business, you're wrong, you're dead wrong. You know, Forbes says 20 years of Russian hacking, the recent cyber solar winds, as you all know, affected 18,000 public and private sector, goes beyond traditional espionage. They are acts of cyber aggression by Russians against the United States system. Five million was paid by Colonial Pipeline. The CEO said the cyber attack will ultimately cost the company tens of millions. Worldwide, in 2015, it was $13 trillion. At the end of this year, it should be $6 trillion. And by 2025, they're looking at $10.5 trillion. According to National Law Review, we have doubled the tax since 2000, from 2019 to 2020. Litigations are on the rise also. Small business, it costs small businesses on an average of $200,000 after cyber breach. Not to mention the IP theft, loss of reputation, your clients and your vendors. And those are hard to overcome, especially if you did nothing to prevent it. And it will come out. 60% of these small businesses go under within six months of a cyber attack. The US should have a kinetic response. In my opinion, I know many of you's opinion, but it doesn't. The U.S. should be doing things to protect American companies, but it is not. And companies should be more cyber resilient, but they are not. Federal government is trying to come up with guidance on what to do, but there's so much bureaucracy sometimes. Biden, on May 12th, ordered an executive order to call to action to federal agencies and their suppliers to significantly improve cybersecurity standards. This unconventional warfare is in our networks, our computers, our lives, and as the nation is woefully unprepared currently, and currently outmaneuvered by our enemies. To top it off, we have over 500,000 cyber jobs unfulfilled. Those low capacities don't leave people with cybersecurity companies, enough people to go out and help the 25 million small to mid-sized businesses out there. Sad, sad truth, they can't. They can't do it, not in the way it's currently being done. Our team at Lionfish is not gonna stand idly by and continue to watch our country get picked apart by those individuals and nation states controls hackers. The time for talk is over and we must act before it's too late. Your company, employees, your families are depending on you. The country needs your help to shore up your defenses. If the DIV, the defense industrial base goes down, our country will not be able to defend itself. If our middle market goes down, the country goes down. You have been the unsung heroes in the past, but you are, like it or not, now the front line of defense for our country. If your networks, if your systems, go down. You know, they are targeting you, and through your company, they attack our country and the Department of Defense supply chain. Together, we can help keep America moving. We can make it harder to gain access to help by being a blocking force while our country's offensive cyber teams do their jobs and attack back 
which is what we hope that you do, man, and do it hard. If you recall the video from Reagan earlier, he mentioned that Martin tripped out, said in 1917, this still is a declaration today. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depends on me alone. Some of you in this room are DOD contractors. Some aren't. They won't know what I'm talking about. But CMMC, you're worried about being compliant now. You're worried about the cost of being compliant. You should be concerned with your company and the country surviving. That is why we are working with the state's next level jobs grant money to help offset or completely pay for your cybersecurity. That way we can focus on the security of the, not the money. If someone told you you must roll your window up 25% in a bad neighborhood known for theft, would you only do that because somebody told you? Or would you roll it up all the way and hide your belongings so the thieves could not take and see your valuables? This is effectively what level one gets you. Nothing that we take, nothing, I, in my opinion, should be at level one. It should be level three regardless of the DOD's contracting uh, requirements. Good cyber hygiene is needed by everyone, so you're not an easy target. Let's put some numbers in perspective and how big this task is. The state of Indiana, I've been told, is about 7,000 federal and DOD contractors alone. There are only five that I'm aware of, RPOs, Registered Provider Organizations with CMNC right now, and the Accreditation Board of Indiana. If everyone needs to be audited in three years, starting today, five companies, We'll need to start onboarding and servicing 39 new clients a month for 36 months. With current methods and number of cyber experts, it would be literally impossible. Who among you wants to be the last one in that three-year chain while your punk company is unprotected? We have to do this much faster. Lionfish is using the by with the three method of the Special Forces to take on small number of trained men and women in helping many companies at the same time to be cyber resilient. We have a plan, we have a vision, and with your help, we will work to perfect this plan and offer our platform to other MSSPs around the country. This is unconventional warfare. It calls for every resource we have available, and we are forging a way out of no way. Rest assured, you don't need to be a cybersecurity expert but we'll help you understand some of the fundamentals so you can train your team to do some of the legwork. Good cyber hygiene and cyber resilience is not a monumental task. It takes some effort and some time. We'll work through and with you, step by step, by, with, and through. You, our partner force. We are taking a daunting task and making it manageable. With our platform and methods, the businesses in the state of Indiana will lead the way. Indiana will show the country the way forward. The hackers have been released, shots have been fired. We hear them now. The enemy is in our wire in the wire and our networks. We are behind, we are not down, but we are not going to give up and we can still win. We will take this chaos and focus on a plan for you and the others in the country as we move forward. This is a no-fail mission for every one of us. I'm going to play a short video. After all, I'll share, you, share shortly of the plan, and then we'll get back together. We'll discuss one of the segments with the Next Level Jobs Grant and how we can help leverage that for your cost. This is by far not an end solution, but it will help with some funding. Yeah. 
jackals free and shake them into swords. Where have all the good men gone and where are all the gods? Where's the streetwise Hercules to fight the rising war? Isn't there a white night upon a fire <laughs> Late at night, I toss and I turn and I dream of what I On need. Your everyone what you wanted more somewhere after midnight in my wildest fantasy somewhere just beyond the reach somewhere reaching back for me racing on the I said one out of 14 million, we win, yeah? I mean, this is it. If I tell you what happens, it won't happen.
we're going to use the next level jobs money to help pay for some of your cybersecurity. And how we do that is we are accredited school in the state of Indiana. We can train your people. I will train your people. They will get a certification of completion. And then we will take that money and I'm going to apply it. I'm not even going to take it from my training company. I'm going to take it and I'm going to apply it towards your cybersecurity so you can secure your company. Now, this money is going to run out. There's only 17 million and it will run out quickly. They open up this grant on July 1. And as soon as that money's gone, you're all going to be fending for and paying for it yourself out of your own pocket for your own cybersecurity. So what we'll do is we're not going to take much time, more time here, but I wanted to share that with you. Uh, one of our guys will reach out to you, set up a time to talk, and um, we'll help you through the whole process. But I want to thank you for coming, and please know that when I tell you these stats, when you see the TV, these are not empty words. You saw what happened with the gas. Think about what will happen with any other type of systems. Okay? If we are not prepared, we will all go down. Thank you for coming. You guys want your bottle, don't you? Okay, so here's what we'll do. We're going to network some more. Um, just go to the back. If you're one of our DOD contractor special guests, please go in the back for your signed uh, bottle. See Alex, and, um, and thank you for coming. <laughs>